So over the next day, we don't want to talk actually about our school as such, but more broadly about the purpose, agency, and reach of the School of Architecture, Art, and Design, what those schools, what the reach might be today, both within and beyond the university. I've been struggling a little bit with how best to introduce the themes of this event. And I think the best way might be for me to tell a bit of a story about the site we're occupying today or, or, or about this crescent. Of course, the site has a very long history. And before delving into the particular story I'd like to tell, I want to engage in a practice that has become an important part of our efforts at reconciliation in Canada, a land acknowledgement. And it goes as follows. We wish to acknowledge this land on which the Daniels faculty and the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. This place where we meet today is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. So the story I, that I want to tell has more to do actually with the colonial history of this site and the architectural origins of spaces dedicated to study, teaching, and research. This site, the Spadina Crescent, was created in the 19th century by one of Toronto's more progressive real estate developers, William Baldwin. He laid out Spadina, this avenue that runs north-south, as a grand avenue to the lake. And drawing on mo modern English examples of the time, created this circle in the middle as a prospect to the lake. Baldwin probably thought Spadina would be the city's great civic street, but University Avenue to, to the east, uh, ending in the provincial capital, took on that role. Spadina instead became the city's vein for waves of immigration in the 19th and early 20th centuries, where we now see mushrooming condominiums at the base of this street, where railroad yards and factories where immigrants worked. The old south-facing portion of this building was built to house the Knox Presbyterian Theological Seminary. And this was a place where young men from the surrounding communities were sent to be schooled, improved, and uplifted through a religious and moral education, that is, to become better Anglo-Saxons. As we know, the origins of the university, especially the research university, which is a German Protestant concoction, are in the religious cloister. And that's what this building was. Knox, though, the Knox Theological Seminary, didn't last long on this site, as it, along with a number of other church and religiously affiliated colleges that were embedded in neighborhoods throughout the city, were amalgamated, or more precisely, federated into the University of Toronto, and were clustered east of us, um, east of us in an attempt to make a proper English-style campus. Colleges with names like Knox, Trinity, Victoria, and a number of others persist around the center of this campus to this day. So after Knox, Knox vacated, this site languished and was then remade as a military hospital and barracks for the First World War. A small military museum was set up in one of the south rooms facing the lake, and you can go up and see that room. This was the same room that had been the library for the Knox Seminary. Recovering soldiers could visit and look down Spadina Avenue to the south to the military bases on the waterfront. Supposedly, Amelia Earhart worked here as an aide during this period. Between the wars, the site and the building languished again and was then acquired and remade by the Connaught Laboratories. Insulin was invented at University of Toronto in the 1920s by a team led by Banting and Best. It's one of the great um, I guess, uh, moments of the University of Toronto. But uh, Connaught Laboratories was, was, were the, 
commercial outcome of this, and, and, and it grew out of the, the, their discovery of, of insulin. Cannot stripped out all the Victorian detail in the building, set up manu the manufacture of insulin, and did some major medical experiments here. The, uh, I guess the remnants of that were something we had to contend with when we started constructing the building, and they were uh, sometimes rather alarming. In the early 1970s, the Connaught Laboratories was sold to Pasteur and decamped to Switzerland, and the University of Toronto acquired this site. But at the same time, Toronto planned to build an expressway down the wide berth of Spadina north of here, coming this way, linking downtown to the suburbs. That would have run right through this site. Like the, no, lower, like the lower Manhattan Expressway before it, the Spadina Expressway was famously stopped by a consortium of activists, including Jane Jacobs. But the die was set for this site for almost another 40 years, as the university had planned all of its new post-war campus west of the, of the Victorian campus, and that's all in that direction, to be very inwardly focused and to turn its back on Spadina Avenue. So despite its brand location, for these and other reasons, this site became a kind of backwater until our faculty had the gumption to remake it once again. I tell this story because the history of this site tracks the evolution of this city, a bastion of Anglo-Saxon colonists, a vein of immigration, a cauldron of manufacturing and entrepreneurship, and up to today and now, a seat of capital and creative industry. And it even more closely tracks the university's co-evolution from a religious cloister to a research uh, laboratory to today when a school of architecture, art and design may now have a more central position and may no longer be the outlier it once was at a university. So the story might also help explain the curious themes and titles of this symposium, in case you're all wondering. Tomorrow we'll have a series of presentations and discussions on the school as a political platform, the school as an incubator, the school as a curatorial space, followed by a discussion that explores, quote, the designs on the university, unquote. Using the terms lobby, test kitchen, and dining room as panel titles is meant to conjure the evolving and always dynamic relationship between the name, the shape, and the intended function of the spaces we use. I think I was in part inspired to do this by the Tietzel le lecture that Mark Yarzenbach, who is speaking here tomorrow, gave at University College here at the university a few years ago, in which he gave a fascinating historical account of the architecture of the corridor. Mark, I don't know if you're here tonight, but um, you'll notice the role that corridors actually play in this building. So, okay, on to tonight's speakers, who are no strangers to the issues that I've just raised or to the challenges of designing spaces for the kinds of creative work we aspire to do. Our first speaker will be Nadir Tarani. Nadir needs almost no introduction here in Toronto because he's been traveling here for a number of years, trying to get this project done. As the principal of NADA, Nadir, along with his partner, Katie Faulkner, is the creative mind behind the building that we sit in tonight. The Daniels Building is not Nadir's only school of architecture. He's designed two others, which I think he's going to speak about tonight. He's, Nadir is also no stranger to architectural education. In addition to his work at NADA, he is dean of the Erwin S. Channon School of Architecture at the Cooper Union in New York and was previously a professor at MIT, where he served as the head of the Department of Architecture from 2010 to 2014. Our next speaker is Shohei Shigematsu. Sho is a partner at the Office of Metropolitan Architecture and the director of its New York office, where he has been a driving force behind the firm's many projects. He is responsible for the firm's cultural projects across North America, including Milstein Hall, the award-winning College of Architecture, Art, and Planning at Cornell University. Shows other, shows other projects include a new museum for the Musée National du Beaux-Arts in Quebec, 
and the Thena Forum, a multi-purpose venue in Miami Beach. Our third speaker tonight Michael, is Michael Maltzen. Michael is the design principal of Michael Maltzen Architecture in Los Angeles, whose work includes a wide range of typologies from cultural institutions to city infrastructure. He recently completed the Moody Center for the Arts at Rice University, which serves as an experimental platform for creating and presenting works of all disciplines and a forum for creative partnerships. Other current projects by Michael's firm include MIT's Vassar Street Residential Hall, the Winnipeg Art Gallery and Inuit Art Center, and a highly innovative series of residences and shelters for the homeless in Los Angeles. So I've not gone too deeply into the records of our speakers, but needless to say, each of our speakers tonight is a highly accomplished and award-winning designer. This evening, each of the speakers will be giving a short presentation, which will be followed by a discussion that they will engage in with myself and Dr. Sarah Diamond, the president of ILCAD University. And I'm going to introduce Sarah after the other speakers finish tonight. So with that, I'm going to ask, um, I think, Nadir, your first, Nadir, to, to, to come up to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, is my mic working? Testing? Does it work? Do I need to use this mic, or can I use the other one? Oh, there we go. It, it does work. Good evening. Thank you so much for uh, the introduction, uh, Richard. And moreover, uh, thank you also for this extended dialogue um, that uh, we have been having um, over the years, uh, hopefully coming to fruition um, soon. Um, what is a school? Um, for me, this is a complex question, obviously, because it's a cultural project uh, and something that maybe more accidentally I have been involved in uh, as a teacher for several decades now. But one wants to believe that uh, architecture as a physical spatial and material phenomena has the power to impact the very pedagogies and the cultural project within which uh, uh, takes place. Uh, it's also an accident that as the world was crumbling, its economy, in 2008, we did about 14 competitions and uh, we won three or four of them and they happen to be, three of them happen to be schools of architecture. Uh, from left to right, Georgia Tech, uh, Melbourne School of Design, and finally the Daniels faculty building. And, and obviously they are very different projects, and uh, I will try to articulate how there's a, while there is no deterministic argument in establishing reciprocity between one and the other, nonetheless, a culture is produced in all of these buildings, much akin to those buildings that we have inherited as students or faculty uh, in our own histories. Understanding that the GSD as a building type or as an organization uh, has its own qualities, uh, designed as a school of architecture uh, and motivated in certain ways while a place like the Architectural Association merely occupies a series of row houses uh, unintended for uh, its purpose. And certainly the same goes for the new Psy Arc, which is uh, a, a freight structure, uh, Lord knows how long, maybe Michael, you can tell us later, uh, with your building uh, on, on its other side. But essentially, they produce a certain culture, I will argue in the way that they work. Uh, the trays uh, of the GSD, as you well know, produce uh, an oblique plane that uh, sets the stage for collective interaction, uh, competition, if you like, 
and the theatricality that can only be compared to the very type from which it emerges. Uh, we can go into that in more detail, but uh, uh, obviously there isn't a stage as such, but uh, the setting of that stage already produces a kind of synergy within uh, the culture of the school. Uh, the AA ha has many aspects to it, uh, fundamentally intimate, uh, producing one-to-one -one relationships with the tutorials than what, that one has on the top floor, and yet the culture that is produced there primarily occurs in the bar. If you look at the bar carefully, its character is rather sterile, uh, but trust me, put in some people there, and uh, it, it becomes uh, the, uh, the hotbed of activity. This is two individuals before they became somebody. <laughs> Um, and Cyark, as you know, is this, uh, essentially this extruded factory that, because of its physical properties, produces a street, uh, the street which becomes the place of interaction. Uh, Pinups uh, is also a place of transportation. Uh, students on, on bicycles, on skateboards, and other kinds of motorized vehicles occupy this internal street and it becomes a, another kind of uh, urban analog for what uh, a place of learning might become. In other words, uh, the relationship between learning and physical space is anything but singular. And so too, it does not produce uh, the Model T or anything identical. It is really a hotbed for different forms of interaction. As part of an extended research that uh, we did while I was at MIT, uh, there was an initiative to study what happens to, that, to the physicality of that place once the internet takes over our lives, which it has. Uh, we work uh, on the beach, we uh, work in the living room, uh, interacting with other people, uh, in the streetcar, we are everywhere, in Starbucks, and so what is the role of the classroom in an age where we don't actually have to be in the studio space if we consider the studio space as the center of the School of Architecture? We've seen other historical passages where we were promised that architecture or the book may kill uh, architecture. And, and technology is once again challenging uh, the way in which we may challenge the campus uh, uh, as a center. And nonetheless, uh, one wants to study the ways in which teaching occurs, uh, top-down, if you would like, instructional, the way that I'm speaking to you now, uh, and what rituals come with that. Uh, would you take a nap if I told you so? Um, indeed, uh, with the digital world, if you look carefully on the screens of these students, only two of them are actually following what's going on the screen. The other ones are looking at babies and other things, if you look to the right. So th the notion of online education uh, brings to question key modalities in which we've uh, discovered different kinds of intera interaction. The Harkness table, the, uh, the parliamentary uh, structure of certain uh, conference rooms, the TEAL uh, organization, places for collaboration, not only locally, but globally. And understanding that uh, knowledge is not only absorbed, but it's actually a platform for fabrication, becoming a way of connecting us uh, on, on a global scale. Equally importantly, we've discovered that we ourselves are educating ourselves online anyway. We, you know, uh, don't have to wait for Thursdays to see Breaking Bad. We can uh, do a binge and, uh, and, and get it any time we want. So why would we have to learn in four years in a kind of closed module? If you debundled education, the space of learning could gain space by uh, having access to internships, for travel, for many other kinds of collaborations. Making the school or the campus a place of interaction. In other words, short of making it a touristic experience, it is the one moment where people come together for something extraordinary. 
Uh, and not only is this about the social interaction, I would like to think that it is about architecture itself. This school in Sao Paulo was not designed for revolution, but in fact it becomes the perfect platform for such. Uh, and I would like to imagine that all of those things that we discuss about how this building will function will be abused by the time that its history is over. In other words, you don't precisely design for things to operate in a certain way, even though we have intuitions about the integration of all of the various elements in the way that Yale may want to work. So looking carefully at Georgia Tech, I will just give hints at uh, what we did, why we did them, and how they may become uh, part of this conversation. A renovation project uh, of the Hinman building came with a high base space, uh, a beautiful factory space, in fact, uh, ready for occupation, too big for a studio, but it would become the main design space. So big that it was uh, a space of the sublime, uh, a social space, almost a space of urbanism. And in fact, as we studied it, we realized that the most flexible way in which we could engage it is to design from top down as, mu as much as from bottom up. The plaza, the space of work at the bottom, can be completely emptied such that the trusses and the gantry cranes from above suspend the studio, the lighting, the second means of egress uh, that produces an architecture that is, uh, if you like, something exceptional in its levity. It is literally suspended uh, to free up the ground for the kinds of activities from the Beaux-Arts Ball to uh, installations, drafting, and other events uh, of the campus. At the Melbourne School of Design, uh, we were promised a design studio uh, that never happened. Uh, the studio that would have been at the top floor of the building was value engineered within the first uh, month of programming. Knowing that we might be able to carve out a relationship between the net to gross area, the circulation into the dedicated classrooms and offices, we realized we could rob some space in order to produce the kind of studio space none of us have seen, not on a flat level, but rather a studio in section, eliminating railings through a stacked series of collaborative tables, drafting tables, and crit areas, the section of this building operates to produce in the round a vertical studio with one dedicated series of studio spaces, the only dedicated studio spaces in its center. Drawing from D.H. Lawrence's experiences uh, in Australia, uh, documented by David Allen, upside down at the bottom of the world, we imagined what it would mean to integrate the foundation of the building into the ceiling, that is, where it drains and where it gains light. Suspended from that ceiling uh, is this iconic moment, the object, the monument, the studio space that they never got, the one moment where a compressive structure uh, stands to be suspended uh, as it cascades down, almost touching uh, the collective level at the base, but not quite. This space is massive and uh, trunk-like at the top and thin and laminar at its bottom. And essentially, uh, as a pedagogical building, it has a didactic function. Remember, uh, buildings like this are not just to be experienced, you have an audience of 1,000, 2,000 people who know how to read it and understand it in a different way. So while, as architects, we like to think of this building in its pristine legibility like this, uh, in fact, it's a piece of infrastructure for the kind of inhabitation it sees 24-7, particularly because they don't have dedicated studios. Um, our time is running out, but I just want to frame uh, the Daniels building uh, as an extension of Richard's uh, introduction. Uh, at the center of Spadina Circle, it sees obstacles in planning, uh, in urbanism, 
in landscape and architecture that touch on the many disciplines that we had to engage in the faculty of the Daniels to extend north from Knox College a box, a very economic box, if you like, with the possibility of extensions in the future that inhabit that landscape. In fact, those urban spaces that are carved on the east, west, and north become an extension of that architecture and in the future yet may change again as they uh, uh, extend certain programs uh, from it. The planning of the building is very simple, obviously, because the cellular spaces of the Knox College provide for the very needs of classrooms and offices, and the studio space economically extends the logic of that same building, creating a void that you and I are occupying tonight. Uh, that space uh, would normally be dark, closed, insular, but the idea is to precisely rob the light and its connection to the various other spaces, creating out of a north-south building uh, an east-west building that uses the logic of the urban context to access a street that extends the logic of the environment all the way through the building. I will now close with the one exceptional moment of this building that was uh, promised to be value engineered and becomes part of, an ex part of the extension of the pedagogical building uh, in the way that it was conceived. As a concrete frame building, we imagined a surface active structural system that in one move would span over 110 feet, would bring daylighting into it, and would control all of the hydrology of the building in order to irrigate the landscape around it. Promised to be, uh, because of the form work and the labor, uh, about a million dollars uh, over budget, uh, it was taken out. And so we built the mock-up of it to d demonstrate uh, that a ruled surface, in fact, is a flat sheet laminar construction. And should we elect to build it uh, out of a steel system, possibly, that uh, it could save uh, over $700,000. And in fact, the passage of this marks the way in which the heating system may be embedded in the ground, the cooling system in a radiance uh, slab above, and uh, uh, bring together the various elements that make this building the result of a kind of robust collaboration uh, that um, makes it not so much part of our authorship, but a collective project that will become the cultural project of, um, of UT. Uh, is this uh, the culture of the UT on College Street? Uh, well, I don't think that just goes away overnight. Uh, but will this produce new cultures uh, and new environments and new relationships? Uh, I cannot imagine that it won't. Um, I will not take you through the rest of this animation, but suffice it to say is that this is a project that is dealing with the urban scale, uh, with the landscape, uh, as well as the micro section. E everything in this animation is outmoded and outdated by now because new systems have, have taken over. But uh, the image of the building, uh, its identity as an extension of the Gothic, uh, takes uh, its cues uh, not so much literally from the verticality of Gothic, but uh, a, a riff, takes a riff on it, and then the facade becomes the index of the very silhouette it produces that brings the water down uh, into the landscape. Thank you very much. Hello. Uh, good evening. I'm very honored to be here. Um, my font is like a default aerial compared to Nadir's. Um, I would like to focus on explaining you the Cornell process and how it uh, was conceived, just maybe not answering philosophically, but just really take you through a practical side. Uh, but I want to start from the word innovation because I think when I started realizing how innovation is abused when I get invited to so many uh, conferences uh, named under innovation. 
So I was interested in uh, looking at how the word innovation has been kind of increasingly used, but instead the word invention is actually being uh, less used. So I was wondering what this kind of shift means also in terms of architectural responses. This is just mapping when I was born. I'm not saying I made the paradigm shift, but uh, <laughs> um, I'm just saying that around 70s when the global economy, market economy started, probably this two started to uh, actually divert. Um, and it's literally the kind of most overused word. And even, as you know, in the White House, there is an innovation uh, led by Mark Kushner, uh, which uh, didn't do anything yet, uh, but just keep changing the staff. Uh, which I kind of sympathize that, because, of course, the word innovation, what, what do you do in a political domain, or even in any domain, like why do we so obsessed with innovation? Um, so the school is now also taking this trend, like everyone, every single major university is making an innovation center. And I don't know what that exactly means, and also you can see how architects are also confused using from like Harvard just reusing the uh, old building, uh, Pritzker Prize, uh, buildings, one is like uh, futuristic, one is kind of fundamental, etc. So as you can see, innovation, the word innovation is kind of confusing everyone. Uh, I'm also doing a project in Boston in the innovation district was just because tech companies moved and all the developers are capitalizing. So we just made a building that splits the building into half below that relates to the old scale, the, the top that relates to the new scale and also cuts through the center that provides the terraces here that is continuous from the park. I'm also doing a new head, uh, uh, Facebook headquarters now next to Frank Gehry's uh, single, uh, single uh, story, uh, almost like a ship-like uh, space. But for the first time, they're going vertically high because they can't sustain the growth of their employees. Uh, so it, the word innovation, and I think this, the word innovation wasn't really there when I started the Cornell process. Uh, it's worth mentioning that uh, architects are often the longest uh, entity that deals with like uh, uh, schools. So during the uh, process of Cornell, there are two like presidents, uh, two provosts, three uh, deans. Uh, so you always, you are the kind of guardian of the culture in a way because. Uh, people change in administration. The second thing that was unique here was that we were the third architects to be on board. Typically, we are the first one and someone takes over. So it was a very uh, um, unique moment. Even there is a conspiracy theory that uh, OMA and Renzo Piano is the same office because after LACMA and Whitney, after we started and he took over. So that's a really interesting conspiracy theory. Um, when, I, when we came in, this, is, this was architecture, uh, art, and planning with very interesting mix of uh, interdisciplinary stu study school. Art squad was here, Gorge was here, but it was kind of neglected here, uh, and the buildings were dispersed into, uh, the different uh, learning was dispersed, dispersed into different buildings, so they, they were not really maximizing the potential of interdisciplinary study. Also from this bridge that was a lot of dorms are built on this side, so this suddenly became a, a gateway. So this is a RAND, which was a, a very humble studio building, suddenly became the first building that the students will see. So school was asking to make a gateway building. This was the north side that was neglected. We did a lot of study because the site was uh, even not defined. They said somewhere here. So we did a lot of uh, study, connecting, making a loop, uh, making a cross that fits between, and then or something like this that, uh, thank God that we didn't choose this, but um, something like this that really conscious of making a gateway gesture. And then this came, which was all defined by existing lines and almost creating a mini art squad on the north side, almost like a found space, which is simultaneously a bridge that connects the uh, Rand and the Sibley. Uh, as Nadir also said and also considered in this school, we had to also prove that the future extensions can be made here. So we made this first studio building here, but in the future planning art and even the Johnson Art Museum built in the 70s by uh, 
um, by um, IMP can also extend under and share in the public uh, parking. So this kind of access hinges, uh, is hinged by the, uh, the Milstein Hall. So we plan this kind of sequence of landscape-like elements that eventually becomes our dome space uh, also underneath the plate. So this was, we had to prove that uh, future vision is ensured. Uh, this is a plate size, so say, almost like a similar size as a crown hall. Uh, it was considered as a, a series of rooms that are interconnected. These are the studies we did. Is it single height? Is it spiral? Is it double, uh, two heights? Or have like a book stack at the edge or connection at the roof? We did all kinds of things, but we in the end just decided to uh, make something very s simple and pure. Uh, what was interesting about providing an open-ended space like this was that we had to really be involved in the pedagogical discussion with the school, what happens here and what the layout of the studio is and how they can change the layout per class or what, what is the interdisciplinary uh, kind of study zone. So we made this kind of more like war room zone, et cetera. So in the end, it's, it just became open-ended, but we were actively participating into the discussion of the pedagogical issue. So uh, that was a kind of rewarding experience. Uh, also using the model to present. Uh, structure initially was just a portals ex above the existing road, but that was a sa the, the safety issue came up, so we had to cantilever suddenly. Uh, for about 48 feet above the existing road. So we studied so many different types, Virendel to truss, to well, different configuration of truss, because we didn't want, of course, interrupt the uh, uh, studio space at the level that we almost could build, make a kind of, uh, I don't know, X story buildings. And then we even had to make a shelf dedicated to structural studies. Uh, but in the end, uh, Virendale was too expensive. Conventional trust creates a lot of head height issues. So we decided to actually look at the moment very carefully and also circulation zone in the center. So in the center where the moment is low and circulation is happening, we kept uh, the uh, Virendale trust and then gradually becoming uh, a trust. So the students can actually uh, realize the forces that are happening on this plate. The, the trust was uh, made in Canada. Uh, and then shipped here. Uh, so this is uh, the cantilever. The bus stop is underneath to have a natural canopy. And you can see the kind of traveling truss from Virendale to uh, uh, actual truss. And this is how it's inhabited. Uh, students are quite good, of course, uh, domesticating their um, um, space. I mean, this is a perfect angle for nap. Um, and this guy invented the, um, the hammock like second day after it opened and then somehow made his kingdom all kind of suspended <laughs> onto a truss, which is respectful. Uh, and then as we intended, like an art squad, we, you know, students are using it as a kind of uh, a plaza. This is ensured because all the infrastructure is on the ceiling. Uh, air, um, chilled beam, data, everything, electricity, everything is on the ceiling and only the floor is only the radiant floor. So uh, the future flexibility is ensured. This is a coordination drawing and as you can see, quite busy ceiling versus very uh, elementary floor. Uh, there is another element which is a dome. It's a concrete structure which is, creates a, con a contrast to the um, uh, upper plate, which is all in steel, uh, and that provides more like a landscape-like element uh, uh, experience and also uh, creating exterior uh, covered exterior space. The construction uh, was also very contrasting in a way. Steel was very on time, very uh, um, smooth here. Because we couldn't uh, fail, we had to really do a, a very dense uh, mold to cast uh, the entire dome in one night. Uh, so the contrast was quite high. Sorry. And then here we thought it, it, it's providing a space that is uh, uh, very different from uh, the upper plate, uh, more urban, more topographic, uh, and uh, more like enticing to uh, improvise. 
there was a lot of skepticism about the uh, covered ex exterior space because, of course, it's cold, but uh, now people are using it quite well. Um, this has an auditorium. This dome, actually, uh, there's an auditorium on top and a crit space below, uh, but you can actually access from studio down to the auditorium like this. So in the lecture, you can go seamlessly down to the lecture hall. Because there's a, a covered plate above, there's a certain level of darkness in short, and while with a triple glazing with the isolated uh, sound, you can actually have a view out while you're in, in the lecture. So you can see cars running, uh, a lot of different activities are happening around you in the auditorium. This is Howard Milstein. Uh, he's the main donor. He was also the board president at the time. So he wanted to make this auditorium a boardroom, not just for the boardroom for the entire university. This was an uh, existing boardroom they were using, conventional. So we thought maybe for the board members, it's nice to provide like business class seats with a, a, a voting system and microphone and so on. And that is reconfigurable like this. But the problem is that the board, only, board meeting only happens uh, twice a year, and this space is, of course, for the students. So we had to find a way to embed this system. So we found this system in Spain that you can actually embed the seats. Uh, so only twice a year, this, the, the crit space actually becomes a, a boardroom, which we thought it was a kind of interesting uh, a reference, like the zombie of the uh, board members are kind of <laughs> appearing every two, uh, twice a year. So this is a kind of boardroom configuration, flat, and the loose chairs. There's a curtain, is provided. this is Petra Blaze's curtain, Dutch per per perspectivist drawing, because there's no column over there because it's cantilevered, we basically said, why don't we provide a virtual column with a curtain? Uh, so the dome has uh, this bridge that takes you from the entrance to the mid-level of the auditorium, but also a flexible wall here to create a crit space that, it's, that ha can have simultaneous crits. You can see this relationship of students observing the crit here. But also, because there's a bus stop here, people who has nothing to do with architecture or who doesn't know anything about architectural education can actually see what's happening which I think is a very interesting encounter. So this is a wall, how it can create a wall, uh, like a two walls or a room. It's like movable, so you can see the bus while the crate is happening. Uh, they do all kinds of events, because also it's an art school, uh, art installation uh, events. Uh, big uh, elevator, because they, of course, have to transport the big models to the crit space. They even do installation in the elevator that are visible from the entrance, like a moving room. Uh, lastly, uh, the toilet is also designed in such a way that uh, it creates a kind of tension between different genders. Uh, so it's a single um, uh, ribbon of uh, stainless steel wall uh, that segregates uh, to sides, so uh, you're always next to a different gender. Uh, but it's a full height, so uh, you don't really hear or smell the next door. But um, basically, it's a kind of ribbon wall that uh, you know that the next door is not a same gender, but different. Uh, of course, this is a sensitive issue, as you know. Now, actually, this is a completely actually complementary to what's happening, not making any distinction between men and women. Uh, lastly, this is the uh, uh, roof, uh, the landscape we simulated from uh, less dense to dense, uh, from quad to gorge, so, and the skylights becoming bigger towards the center to provide even natural light. Uh, roof, was, roof access was ve also, uh, which is a pity because you have a great view to the gorge from the roof. Uh, now I'm very happy to see that the RAND is now being converted to the um, um, library and then creating this kind of uh, final goal of making a, a gateway for the college. Thank you.
I'm uh, approaching this topic uh, tonight more from art practice and art education, given that we haven't had the opportunity to uh, design an architecture school, which I have to say has to be one of the most courageous acts an architect can agree to. The thinking about and making of buildings and space for art practice has some similarity, though, to spaces for architectural education, given the cultural, social, and institutional pressures that exist at this moment even if those practices are parallel practices and not necessarily uh, exactly the same um, uh, from a disciplinary uh, standpoint. Richard and I, leading up to this conversation, Richard discussed three types of spaces that relate to the question of physical space for schools uh, at a point when the need for physical space itself is being questioned in the face of a more digital world, but even more by evolutions, I think, in generational expectations and the thinking of those that are going to be using these spaces. The first type of space Richard mentioned was a political space. Increasingly, we're seeing the ambitions by institutions that we're working with to be an active and visible participant in the political conversation in society, and in that ambition to make that political conversation a primary means of developing and connecting to a constituency for the art that they are collecting and presenting. In the UCLA Hammer Museum, originally designed in the late 1980s by Edward Larrabee Barnes, one of his very last projects, and an existing building that we've been uh, patiently remaking over the last 18 years. The goal has been to make great spaces to see art, but even more so to make a kind of public infrastructure that is helping to support the museum's large, larger mission, which is moving from an idea about just uh, solely presenting work to one, um, this is from their mission statement, uh, that directly talks about their engagement, their presence in the world um, as a whole. We have remade and added to and are continuing to remake and add to the existing galleries, broadening their types and diversity and size and scale. But we've also made a series of spaces that include uh, an incredibly um, highly capable uh, theater for everything from early nitrate uh, silent film to the latest, uh, latest digital technologies, a new bridge that connects content across an existing courtyard. Uh, it, uh, creates um, a connection for the uh, curators in ways not previously possible uh, and are continuing to remake the courtyard itself, which in our climate, Southern California, has continued to serve as the most important space really in the museum. Not a form, but a space, a place of physical presence for the political and social debate at the core of the Hammer's mission. In the Hammer Project, the new architecture is not always visible in the traditional architectural way, but exists sometimes more as a strategy, uh, as, as a kind of, um, uh, kind of armature of, of this political community uh, that they are trying to grow. The second type of space that we talked about was the curatorial space. Uh, it's often traditionally understood as the space of, we didn't do this gallery, uh, the space of the chronological or narrative uh, structuring of the presentation of ideas. The temporal inevitability of the story that is being told has been increasingly challenged though by a number of institutions and individuals, maybe most vividly by Nicholas Sirota, the director of the Tate Galleries, uh, especially during the um, uh, Herzog Demeron Tate Modern project in his book, Experience or Interpretation. He began to promote a type of blending of two seemingly at odds curatorial positions, the scholarly, academic, and intellectual structuring of art and its content in that kind of narrative form, and alternatively, the experiencing of work in a completely immersive, visceral, and perhaps even emotional way. Blending these two types of, of spaces was then uh, a somewhat radical curatorial idea, but it's becoming more common as museums like the Tate or MoMA begin to institutionally, uh, institutionalize the idea across the entirety of their latest building projects. But you can also see this idea uh, or, or strategy beginning to occur in small moments in e 
any number of museums, including this um, installation, a small moment in the uh, Princeton University Art Museum, where two very different periods from their collection are, are, constant, are, are consciously uh, 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 placed next to each other. Uh, if, actually, if a more complex a historical presentation of work is one future venue for the work that artists make, what kinds of space provides an equivalent testing grounds in art education for developing artists? One scenario might be the reaffirmation of the flexible, if somewhat ubiquitous and generic white cube, but another might be the curation itself of a broader range of, of unique, uh, specific, uh, spaces and activities within a school that allow for the creation, uh, not so much of those spaces, but more provocative adjacencies, relationships, even short circuits between spaces uh, and seemingly unrelated content. The third type of space that we discussed was the incubation space, and in many ways the studio space, which is uh, different uh, very often technologically between architecture schools and, and, and art schools, but share um, a lot of similarity as well. The studio space where ideas are made, the space of testing, the space of failure, the space of making. In the Moody Center for the Arts, which Richard mentioned that we just completed um, last year at Rice University, this kind of space exists in traditional studios, but also, uh, and uh, in traditional making spaces, but also in the range of programs and spaces from galleries, black box theater, uh, making studios, analog shops, digital studios, fabrication shops, all with a significant transparency and connection between them. Uh, in almost all cases, there's a sense of the space next to you, a kind of simultaneous uh, uh, experience within the building. It's both flexible and specific, and importantly, spaces are not really owned by anybody, uh, certainly not any one person uh, or uh, department. During the course of this project's uh, development, I kept thinking about what kind of space for this generation of makers might be most useful and equivalent to their experiences, perhaps for a generation that arguably has access to all information and all images. The right space might point away from the generic uh, and abstractly flexible and more to a, a kind of specific, almost bento box of, po of possibilities, spatially. The combination of all of these space types is important for the Moody's purpose. The Moody is meant to be a center that provides for cross-disciplinary arts-based work, not only from the departments within the university, but also for individuals, institutions, and ideas outside the university. The Moody is not aligned with any one specific department, but instead is a kind of connective armature itself for creative ideas and forms. A spatial sponsor, if you will, for the widest range of contemporary ideas in creative culture. I thought that in a way, the Moody was possibly a kind of microcosm of the idea of, of of campus itself, and an idea that uh, in some ways has been touched on uh, by Sho and by Nadir as well. And with the form of the building uh, uh, that might come from the fantasy of taking the forms of the buildings that house specific disciplines on the campus, and then the many quad spaces that support informal interaction, and, and, and almost smush them together to make the new building. Most of the entire ground floor uh, of the Moody above the solidity of, of the very specific, or some of the very specific uh, making spaces is bounded by glass. The building uh, starts to feel like it's a series of individual pavilions pushed together floating above uh, the landscape of the campus. And the many simultaneous activities on the inside are largely visible from the outside uh, or the exterior. It's, uh, it's building in a way at its best when it's a facade of multiplicity. This building brings me to what I think is at stake uh, in, in all of these buildings that we're talking about right now. Much of society has increasingly placed a premium on specialization, but given the increasing complexities, 
that we uh, face in the world, the things around us. I believe there's an even greater place for the generalist uh, and the generalist's education, an education that teaches us how to uh, do the widest range of work uh, to uh, have an impact, to evaluate, to be critical of complex and competing information, and to develop a way to create forms and spaces that fold that complexity into our life in positive ways, and to be able to represent and communicate those ideas, what we're doing in a direct and transparent way as well. Thank you. I'm going to quickly introduce Sarah Diamond, Dr. Sarah Diamond, and then ask everyone to join uh, me on the stage. Sarah is the president of the Ontario College of Art and Design, or as we know here more locally, OCAD University, located a few blocks southeast of here. Since her appointment as president in 2005, she has led OCAD's evolution to a full university, helping to build its transdisciplinary research capacity, create its digital futures initiative, launch the indigenous visual culture program, and grow its undergraduate and graduate programs in studio art and design. Among other important initiatives, uh, those are among uh, um, many other initiatives that she's uh, been involved in. She herself is a researcher in media arts history and policy and visual analytics. Her works reside in collections such as the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the National Gallery of Canada, and the Vancouver Art Gallery. Prior to presiding, over OCAD, Sarah was the founder of the Banff New Media Institute, which she led for over a decade. So thank you for joining us, Sarah, and come up on stage with the speakers. Now we're all supposed to turn up our microphone. Yes, yeah. it's on. My light is on. Yes, I'm going to ask Sarah to kick this off. So um, um, thank you very much. I mean, those were, um, I think we're buzzing still. Um, those were um, incredibly uh, enlightening and um, inspiring presentations. And um, I think it, um, you know, it, it just is, is testimony to both the challenge of working to um, express the needs of creative communities um, and also, um, you know, ground those in um, the site um, and its specificity. So um, I wanted to um, uh, kind of make some commentary maybe about um, some of the challenges that I see as a leader of an art and design school, um, you know, right now um, in, in the current context, and then maybe lead off with, uh, with a couple of questions. So, um, I mean, I think one of the um, almost demands, um, you know, on the university now, and, and I think universities are responding well, and here I'll place art and design schools in this context, um, is to um, kind of lose a sense of segregation from the community that surrounds the learning environment. Um, you know, um, so many of us are engaged in a sort of complex set of um, um, relationships with um, communities that are um, either representative of our student base um, or have different kinds of complex needs in the context of Canada, many of us with indigenous communities. Uh, in the context of Toronto, um, you know, our student base, uh, it's a public institution, phenomenally diverse, many of them first generation um, to actually attend post-secondary education, and frankly coming with um, a set of cultural knowledges, um, some from real trauma um, in terms of uh, the process that led their families to uh, the Canadian context, um, but with, um, you know, a sort of aesthetics and, um, and cultural knowledge that's very different from the kinds of traditions that, um, and Richard, I loved your history of this site. It was, it was really, um, you know, it was very rich, but the sort of cultures and traditions that have formed, um, you know, the, the space of learning for design, for architecture, and even for visual art. So um, we're involved in a number of building projects right now, and, and part of our conversation at our institution is, um, you know, how do we kind of migrate um, 
our sense of even spatial uh, organization to be responsive, for example, to indigenous knowledge and culture and to these um, very different sorts of cultural modalities that um, students um, and now increasingly our faculty because we have um, a lot of faculty who come from international experiences, are very diverse, you know, bring to the table. So um, my, my first question is, I mean, what I thought was very exciting in each of the, pro in the projects that, that, you know, you shared with us is this is a sense of interdisciplinarity, is a sense of rethinking the process of studio learning, um, of understanding the value of the critique and yet um, either making it publicly accessible, um, observable, um, or sort of cited in this um, uh, way where it's less maybe ritualized. Um, uh, so I, I'm wondering if you could uh, share how you've thought through that sort of challenge of um, the changing demographics, you know, of the student learning communities for um, our disciplinary areas, for, for design, for architecture, for visual art, um, you know, in the 21st century. Many of us have a lot of international students, but we have a very different demographic than um, um, even, you know, 15 years ago, maybe entering our disciplines. So I wondered if you'd care to comment a little bit on that question, whoever would like to pick that up. Um, I can start by <clears throat> comparing what has happened to us all digitally, meaning in the internet environment, uh, in the past 20 years in relationship to also uh, new kinds of demographics that are happening in, ad in admissions. While uh, admissions has changed radically in, in the last 20 years, uh, the result of globalization, um, it, it is making for certain needs in schools that uh, at least the US where I was educated in college did, did not require in those years. So questions of diversity uh, are as much cultural, uh, linguistic, uh, but also attitudes towards uh, gender, sexuality, and a range of other things have changed the spaces in which uh, we teach and learn. And, and of course, the, the, uh, the bathrooms were uh, sort of a hot political issue a couple of years ago that have sort of uh, begun to open up not merely as a functional issue but as a cultural issue and it's been de debated and you know, people like Joel Sanders are having discussions around it. But, but what is equally interesting for me about this question of uh, demographics is the way in which um, the hierarchies of, of cultural centrality, the way that we grew up uh, in the Ivy Leagues or in through certain presses have uh, all but collapsed because of the ways in which other economies, whether they be in Iran, uh, in China, in Chile, or other countries, have been able not only to absorb those cultures with certain immediacy, but contribute back to them, uh, radicalize them, uh, build them if it need be, and to uh, invert certain hierarchies that were there once. So while uh, knowledge and education have become uh, democratized as a result of this, it has also led to a kind of accessibility which has broken down the insularity of certain disciplinary boundaries which uh, we grew up through and in. Uh, architecture is no longer the architecture studio, it, it is many things. And so you, you, uh, we, we were all really amused by your um, images of the innovation centers, um, which were sort of these global phenomena, but I also thought they in some ways represented different um, ways that this concept of innovation, um, maybe loss of invention, but innovation, invention, incubation, maybe played out in, in different kinds of, um, you know, just national contexts. So just curious about your thoughts about um, Again, my question. Yeah, the, the demography issue, I work in Japan also, not only in the US and North America. And it, there, I, I, maybe this kind of uh, over um, appreciation or overthinking about the internet, you know, global 
diversity issue because somewhere like in Japan, uh, it's like wherever I go, like in the studio or work session, it's like 99% Japanese people or maybe higher. So it's like, you know, maybe you think the world is actually, actually reaching to <laughs> diversity, but uh, in my, my part, part of my life, you know, I still have to deal with this kind of thing, which I don't think it's uh, not necessarily a bad thing, but of course uh, they're missing out something, but also we were talking just before we came in here how recession, long time recession in Japan actually took a kind of healthy distance uh, for Japan to a kind of globalization in a certain way and started to develop its own voice, its own representation, its own many things. Um, and I'm also teaching at uh, American universities and there are hardly any Japanese actually going out of Japan anymore, which is like a, a really interesting um, shift from, you know, in 80s or earlier, like so many Japanese were actually coming here to study in North America. So uh, I don't know that this demogra demography change issue is of course quite serious here, but there, I think we should also think about how to deal with kind of monoculture. <laughs> and uh, I think, I'm not answering your question, but uh, just that, that came into my mind. Also, when I, whenever I go to like Russia, also like just like 100% Russian people when you meet the client, you know. So uh, I don't know, it's um, maybe North America is too developed or maybe there are kind of stark difference uh, started to happen. Yeah. Michael, do you have a comment? Or should I move on to another uh, question? Well, <coughs> the thing that, the, the, the thing, the un, one thing that strikes me about the project that we did at the Moody was um, that it, it wasn't so much, well, there are two things. One, um, the, the impetus for the Moody was not uh, a, devel a departmental need. It was, um, it was really an institutional need across the entire university because uh, things, their demographics and the way that they've been able to, uh, some departments are shrinking, some are growing. Um, it's been very, it was difficult to imagine growing the art department specifically in and of itself. Uh, and because they're now touching on such a wide range of, of generations from people coming in as freshmen to continuing education at that school, in graduate schools, uh, they were looking at trying to create a new form of center uh, to deal with that, 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 those different um, bandwidths. Uh, so they are trying to deal with it um, almost through the invention of a new type of form of center or department uh, even more so, the building is responsive to that. But I did think that in all three uh, presentations, one uh, common through line was how much um, the buildings that everybody was making uh, seemed to refer to a kind of urbanism as opposed to the cloister, which is very different um, uh, type of model for the traditional institution or university. That idea of, of making a building that, if it's not literally outside the normal confines of the university, like this building is, um, starts to connect to even things like bus stops. Uh, it, uh, in the case of the Moody Center, is placed right at the edge of the campus. It's meant to be the kind of threshold between uh, those worlds. And that, that ambition, I think, is as important in some ways as, as uh, any of the buildings specifically. Yeah, well, that, that's great, and that sort of picks up um, maybe on, on the sort of beginning point I was making, and perhaps you could follow up on this, which is when you're imagining these buildings, how do you think about porosity? Like, we use that term a lot at Oakhead University, which is the ability to, um, you know, flow um, different kinds of publics, and I mean, the, the hammer example is one where you literally showed that, but, but also um, different kinds of communities and industry partners to sort of move people elegantly in and out of, you know, the learning space and the research space of buildings which in the past would have been quite fixed. So how do you think about that adaptability um, and access, um, you know, in, in the work that you're doing? And it does build, Michael, on what, you know, you were just saying. 
Well, uh, from our standpoint, there, there's one of the things that we've, um, uh, I think, come to realize is that there's a difference between porosity, um, literal porosity, and transparency. Uh, they're sometimes conflated, but they're, they're very different things. And actually, the transparency is in some ways the more complicated uh, problem because um, in a lot of creative work, uh, not everybody wants to be that exposed all the time. Um, uh, that's almost where the flexibility uh, from the work we've been doing has, th that's where we've had to concentrate a lot of the flexibility to make spaces that can change from being really opaque to being very connected visually um, to, to everything around it. The, the physical porosity and the connections to either the campus or to the urban situation uh, is more uh, a type of choreography. Um, it's more um, how you are going to think about uh, the controls or lack of controls and the movement through uh, a building over the course of the day. And I think that's something that is architectural in the sense that those spaces are a part of the architecture, but it has much more to do with the overall, this sounds very generic, but operational strategy to the school. How is the school literally going to operate over the course of the day and uh, evolve with the course of the day as it connects to the community around it in, 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 in different nuanced ways? What's, what's interesting about this is that this discussion about the building as, a, as an extension of urbanism is happening at a historic moment where issues of security are magnified tenfold. So in fact, while we may want to break down certain barriers, knowing fully well that that is the only way to uh, bring in a community or to break down silos or compartmentalize ways of thinking, there are more and more uh, barriers uh, uh, for many reasons uh, to, that stop people from coming into buildings, into institutions. And so a lot of these issues have, uh, have to be negotiated quite aggressively and or to get the security barrier displaced uh, in, in the context of the Melbourne building, actually, uh, it was uh, displaced to the second floor so that the first floor is truly public and uh, is uh, accessed by the entire community altogether. Yeah, it's, yeah. Inter it's interesting. Uh, um, a number of years ago, I was involved for some reason in a number of discussions about campus planning and campus design. And uh, one of the slides I would begin with was the um, campus at NYU, which is you think of as, uh, like University of Toronto, as being highly embedded in the middle of the city. But I managed to get a, ma a, a, a plan of where all the security cameras were. Uh, and um, you, know, all, you know, basically the network that they had to maintain to allow that campus to exist. And it was, uh, I, it was extensive. Um, yeah. the, the, the security regime that is overlaid over the middle of New York City. Mm -hmm. You teach in New York City, so you have to, uh, in, in, in a cloister. Right. Um, so, I think it's also in relevant in the workspace design too. I think there was a celebration of open office for a while, but now the backlash is definitely happening. Uh, so the openness is not necessarily uh, uh, only celebrate. It's not celebrated solely. So a lot of people are actually trying to create a. Uh, uh, open-looking segregated spaces or at least like a diversity of spaces that are you know you can actually shift the workplace from one, one open to the close and w working with someone like Facebook which is not spatially they're architecturally they're ambitious on having something great but what they're ambitious of is that they take the record of the usage of the meeting rooms and all the rooms and then they get the immediate feedback and they immediately change the rooms that are not often used or too small or too big. So there's a, almost like urbanism, like a, the city, but the, it's kind of um, um, metabolistic activities are happening much faster than uh, typical uh, office space, which is kind of respectful and interesting in a way that uh, how innovation or some kind of encounter could be enhanced through that kind of feedback system and sensors. Mm -hmm. 
the same as security too. But. So that, that's, that leads to um, just another set of comments, which is, um, you know, when we think about uh, art and design institutions, there are more and more uh, research institutions. I think we've, we've moved to both, um, you know, studio-based education, research creation, and, and, and research. And in a way, there's two kinds of materiality to that. Um, there's the, the ways that we think about materials and their transformative nature, and also the ways that materials themselves are transforming and our use of them. And then there's the whole sort of virtual and data space, which you so eloquently just referred to um, in terms of Facebook. So, um, you know, in, in a sense, when we think about these, um, these institutions, we are in a way, a showcase of next generation, potentially of next generation thinking and practices about um, materials as they're coming on stream, the use of materials, sustainability, um, our responsibility around those kinds of questions. And then we also have to you know, work with um, the collection of data in ways that it's meaningful to transform the space and also the kinds of virtual practices. So, um, and um, Richard, I want you to answer this too. So as, as you are thinking about this space and as, you're, as you are building these um, magnificent, magnificent physical spaces, how are you also uh, addressing, in a sense, the challenge of almost the responsibility to undertake material research, um, you know, to kind of test the next generation of materials, to think about that, to make that um, eloquent and, and evident in many ways? Um, you know, as designers. Do you want to answer that, Andrea? Uh, well, I certainly I can start it. I mean, I, I, our practice um, in its infancy was very much dedicated to this kind of experimentation with materials because it, we simply didn't have commissions and we could afford to play uh, at the scale of installations and, and furniture and, uh, and gizmos and so, you know, looking at material behavior, looking at uh, the means and methods of assembly, and, uh, and looking at the way that they interact with the body became a, a kind of proto-architectural uh, avenue for us to enter into this discussion about uh, materials. Since then, a lot has happened that is much more exciting, of, of course, because uh, many of the people that are part of the next generation uh, come from material sciences and so they are looking at uh, behavior from the point of view of biology, from a uh, computational point of view, uh, from the point of view of interactive design, uh, excuse me, interactive technologies. And so uh, the ways in which uh, buildings are considered responsive environments uh, they are protagonists speaking back to you, in, in fact, and uh, measuring you, uh, they are sensing you, uh, makes for a very different kind of um, architectural craft uh, for us. Now, in the context of this building, um, the Melbourne building, every little thing is a huge victory because I would argue that strangely practice as it unfolds in the construction industry is a, uh, and in the administration of universities and the, the processes that get them checked off and signed off is in, in fact quite conservative. So uh, uh, whereas everybody can agree on the Hippocratic Oath of sustainable practices, quite often uh, the administration won't sign off on certain things that seem obvious and evident to us. So I think that uh, there's a political dimension to, to your question also, uh, which uh, would ask us uh, how to prompt a completely different contractual relationship between designers, uh, patronage, and the construction industry to catalyze uh, the research power that is out there right now and could be harnessed in a more effective way. So I'm going to answer the question a little, with, with a, getting a little even farther into the pragmatics. Uh, Nadir said that this project was a kind of um, product of a dialogue and a, kind of a consortium of people and so um, everyone brings different values to a project uh, and I would say universities and institutions it's not just being conservative. Uh, they, and it's not just that they don't want to spend more money. They're 
the, the, especially for a public institution, the, 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 the idea or um, public show of doing things uh, or of being efficient is important, sometimes more than actually saving the money. <laughs> uh, we experience that here. I, so I, I want to say, uh, the, I would say roughly the square foot cost of this building is probably half of the Cornell building, which is at a wealthier private institution. And uh, yes, I think I know that. Um, <laughs> Uh, because I've looked into it, um, and we we have the same we have the same we have the same um, we have the same uh, now at University of Toronto the uh, the, the, the university this, architect this gives the, the university wrong architect for Cornell that OMA is now the like... university architect for uh, University of Toronto. No, it's so. really not maybe. In, in any case, uh, you, maybe you, you, have, you had to but cut Cornell there. Cornell is also not that high. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it could be higher, of course. Yeah. Yes, uh, uh, these, these are all relative uh, relative terms. But I think uh, when Nadir says to fight for things, you know, there are several things we fought for in this project. One was, one, one was the fourth facade that he explained up here to bring natural light deep into the building and, and ventilation. Um, one of our partners in the project was uh, at the university, or my partner was Barry Sampson, our, our yeah. former dean's partner in practice, who felt, uh, whose own practice is very committed to sustainability and ver felt very strongly that this project should embody that, not only in fact, but in spirit. Uh, and so there, there, there are investments here that are invisible, like the, like the what we call the bubble deck slab that yeah. forms the the, the concrete uh, that we stand on, which has all of the systems, uh, which has you know all of the heating, and which brings a certain um, efficiency to the building. But I think at a certain point we had to decide that more ambitious um, things like sensor-based uh, responsiveness would uh, would have to be adapted in this building over time. So the building is a kind of uh, scaffold or infrastructure, which this is pretty tough. And in fact, many of the furnishings and finishes are very basic because uh, our students and staff have fabricated them themselves. So uh, it's more of a DIY effort here uh, than you will see in other places. Uh, but there are, I think, there is in the kind of spirit of uh, the daylighting of the building and in having the, the windows open and all these things, the capacity for this building to evolve uh, over time uh, to address some of these issues. I'm curious about what you're facing in terms of this kind of sustainability issue in, ter in the building design because now I'm doing a high rise in Tokyo. The, the, the performance uh, um, criteria is so, so stringent, stringent yes. that you can't basically, you can't do an office building with all glass anymore. Mm -hmm. Or all glass but this closed cavity thing that there's a blind that comes in, in between the uh, glass, etc. I mean, it seems like the, the technologi technological development of material and the, the ambition of sustainability and the uh, architectural aesthetics or conventional like understanding of aesthetics is not really kind of uh, in line, no, it I seems like. Well, well, we all know that there are technologies that can be more sustainable in the way we make buildings. Uh, they take a certain kind of investment in the time into the design of the building and then also in its execution. But y you've seen the condominiums in mm. downtown um, yeah. Toronto. Yeah. They're, they're, they have a lot of glass. I think, <laughs> I, you know, in a lot of ways, I've become very uh, suspicious uh, of materials mm -hmm. uh, in, in, ter in, in the values that we give them and what they are supposed to mean, given the context of the economics and uh, uh, the construction industry that you're trying to uh, to work with, and that o the office building in glass, I think, is a very good example. We're doing an office building right now in San Francisco, and we have these um, uh, very clear energy criteria, mm -hmm. and we can. The client says we can go and get glass from any place in the world, and so we came got 12 different samples of glass that fit within this criteria and you line them all up and they're literally from like 12 different companies and they look exactly the same. Yeah. So your choice is, um, is in fact more minimized given these other parameters. It's yeah. why, uh, as opposed to materials, um, construction technique for me mm -hmm. uh, is a place where we've put more emphasis. I think there's... Um, something very interesting there because that gets at uh, a place where potentially the architect still has the ability to have real control on um, 
uh, on the thing that they're trying to make. They're part of the political system, the social system, the economic system. And the housing we're doing, that's uh, the major part of the game, is can you change, even in subtle ways, the construction approach, even though you're using exactly the same materials uh, as a spec house might be uh, using, the construction technique and the schedule and the, uh, has and the budget, those, those are the things that uh, end up uh, allowing you to uh, transform your approach to the building, I'm finding, more mm -hmm. so than a material choice one mm -hmm. way or the other. So um, one of the premises of tonight and, and tomorrow is this uh, notion, you know, that the spaces that we create for students to, um, to learn in, uh, and you all spoke eloquently to this, you know, have an effect on um, pedagogy and how they understand themselves as emerging artists and designers and artists. So uh, just to end, if um, each of you could comment on um, your hope for the students that inhabit these fantastic spaces that you've designed, um, you know, succinctly, maybe one sentence of um, your hope or wish for what they will take away from learning in these spaces. Who would like to start? Uh, I, I like the, the images show showed of Milstein where um, the students were, had a, uh, uh, it wasn't so much respect or uh, disrespect, it was just a full engagement with the buildings. And um, that's a kind of possibility in these buildings that you don't get in a lot of other, uh, in a lot of other university or institutional buildings because uh, the parameters are so tight. Uh, the ability to make the building your own and to be in a, uh, in a real conversation with these types of buildings uh, I think is, is, is a very positive uh, possibility. Well, mm, I don't want to refer to REM, but once um, when I was still in Rotterdam, there were, we were in a, this kind of mosque and design office building, and then there were like empty floor suddenly available. So we decided to put the competition team into a kind of completely unfinished, really cold, like basically all concrete floor and then put the competition team. And then they started to use a space really in a different way than they were when they were in the office. And then somehow the production, seemingly the production also changed. Mm -hmm. And then I think that was a revel um, revelation to me how actually the spatial space can actually tri uh, trigger a different way of thinking, a different way of producing. Because they didn't have to care about anything, they would just made a mess. And then I was, of course, very encouraged by the, all the mess the I mess. saw. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, maybe more, it could be even more messy. Um, and the contrast of beautiful roof and the messiness, I think, is uh, quite beautiful. So I don't know, I think, uh, there is, of course, a relationship with uh, uh, production and uh, the way the space is set up, and I think it all looks promising. It's funny, Mark Ryan, who worked, uh, used to work with OMA, oh, yeah. uh, and, and who did the landscape here, I was, I was walking through and doing a tour with him when it was an even bigger mess about three weeks before school was ending, and he, he went up there and he looked and he said, this is like OMA. <laughs> which I, I took as a compliment, I guess. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. yes, I think so. <laughs> and, you know, I was trying to refer to REM when someone asked REM um, which grad school uh, this person should go, and REM just said, like, just go to Exciting City. That's what mm -hmm. he said. Anyway, whatever that means. <laughs> Toronto is an exciting city, so that's also a problem. Awesome. Look, I, I think... Uh, the key things that have been said, I concur with. I think, you know, the, the ability to appropriate a space is a very important one. Mm -hmm. but, but that also means that from our end, particularly for these schools, spaces of learning, uh, that the architect learns the art, the delicate art of incompletion, mm -hmm. so that uh, the students, the faculty, may have the space for their agency uh, 
And if you can imagine, uh, and we go through this all the time in school, uh, the debate of whether you're preparing the students for the profession well enough. Uh, and my response is always, well, the profession that we know of today is on the verge of obsolescence in the traditional way anyway, so why would you prepare them, prepare them for something that's going to be irrelevant in three or four years? Uh, what is it that we're meant to do if, if we cannot develop uh, in them a a sense of critical agency in their ability to transform the environment, yeah. well then these are the spaces that have to cultivate that in their incompletion. Mm -hmm. So Nadir knows this, but many people in the audience will know it more. Um, we moved in this, to this building almost a year ago and it's been an exciting but actually very difficult year. Uh, a bit of a shock to the system because we jettisoned all the old desks and uh, it settled down a little bit, but last, last fall, it was, uh, it, there was a great deal of chaos um, in the studio uh, because of this change to the death system and because we hadn't quite figured out how to deal with this. this uh, actually, the, the idea that you had, which was basically everything below 10 feet would belong to the students in the school, and we would figure out how to use it, and the kind of architecture exists in this, in this very uh, uh, beautiful roof above that or the ceiling. Uh, and the conviction we had, or the idea we had, that there would be the studio, but then the students, uh, we would try and conceive of the school in a little bit like your idea of the bento box, that there would be a variety of spaces, that schools of architecture and art are no longer just about m making things in the studio, but you have, we expanded the space of the library, which is really like the, the space of the cloister. We uh, expanded the space of the workshops. We created all sorts of unprogrammed space in the corridors. And so the idea was the students would, um, well, all of us, the faculty and the students, would figure out uh, in a kind of Goldilocks year how to do this. But uh, it, it actually turned out to be more um, difficult and more trying uh, than, than I think we thought uh, because, because we did leave the building unfinished in many ways. In fact, there are par whole parts of it that were unfinished. And uh, engaging a very large community of students and faculty in, in something which is unfinished and trying to conceptualize that is, is uh, I think, important but extremely challenging. So I think we've had our wrap-up note from we, our friend. Uh, yeah. And um, no, over to you, Richard. Over? Okay. Well, uh, I invite all of you to join us tomorrow when there will be more time for uh, questions. Um, I want to give an incredible thanks to our guests, uh, some of whom have flown a long way to be here tonight, uh, um, Michael uh, Sho and Nadir and uh, Sarah for um, coming over and sharing your great institutional and, uh, and um, uh, knowledge as, a, as a, both a maker and a leader of uh, schools of our art and design. And let's do it some more. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.